Universe, welcome to Pickathon Podcast, Episode Nine. I'm your host Zale Schoenborn. I'm the founder of the Pickathon Music Festival outside of Portland, Oregon, in the beginning of August every year. This is a podcast where we try to get into cool discovery. We're gonna do that again today, and just have fun. Just go go places that we didn't expect, hopefully. And my musical guest today is Courtney Marie Andrews. She's actually been to Pickathon in the past, 2017. She'll be here again in 2023. So we're going to be honored to come to that. And, you know, when I, there's some, there's some good stories that connects us to Courtney. Courtney's music really transcends a lot of genres for me, but it's often kind of brought into this, you know, home of Americana and Pickathon has, has this name that almost screams banjos and pick, you know, we always get into this kind of argument about well, what is what kind of music Pickathon? You guys have banjos and guitars. And we say, no, no, no. We pick the music. That's what it is. It's, it's, I'm a mandolin player. So it's actually a little bit of a double and, you know, like there's some meaning there, but you know, Americana is a funny thing for us because it's Pickathon has always been broader. I always think of Americana as like a way that it's a very broad genre. And in some ways, it's just there's a lot of regional styles that when you start to get outside of them and you're kind of mixing them in some way, it doesn't fit into these American kind of root styles. It ends up getting thrown into this bucket called Americana. And I, you know, I think, you know, it can be a good thing, but I'm also not really sure, like for us, We've always tried to describe these kind of like, you know, what we think of of the music as, you know, th- this is like this artist. And and yes, they have a lot of styles and some styles hold like, you know, together, like in a, in a class like Cajun music or bluegrass. But when, um, you know, when it comes singer songwriter, like somewhere between indie rock, folk singer songwriter, it starts to and it has, you know, these these kind of elements, you know, Americana comes in and it it has become more popular as a you know, with folks, the luminaries like Gillian Welch and, you know, way back when we had Avid Brothers, they're kind of considered in that world. But, you know, all these artists really kind of transcend for me. And so it's I still have a little bit of trouble with this to kind of name Americana because I think it's about the artists. And just like we think it's about the music, like there's no way to really categorize, you know, all of these artists in the same place that come to the festival in these different root styles as kind of just one thing. They're all amazing and they have their own stories and they have their own regional influences. And so, you know, that's just the way pop culture kind of treats this music is kind of in a box until it becomes accessible on the pop radio or you have really, you know, I have to say one of the really wildly strange things is Billy Strings, who's playing the Moda Center, which is the big arena where the Blazers play. That's not expected. We had him at Pickathon when he was tiny. And, you know, I would say that's kind of Americana. It's big bluegrass, but it's he's way bigger. And now you have something that's actually totally crossed over. It's still not on the radio. You don't really hear Billy Strings on any radio, but it's so, you know, there's such passion for just this type of like tradition of American tradition of musics of all these styles that grew up regionally. It wasn't like a master plan. It was like somebody made stuff up. Other people copied them. All of a sudden it becomes a style. And I'm kind of thrilled that there's kind of a catch all place, but I, I would love it to kind of be matched with national radio and, you know, not, not kind of being thought of as that's cute. Cause none of this, this music's amazing, you know, this style, you know, of Americana, whether you think of Pickathon as, you know, having kind of a lot of bands in this world or not, we always look at all of these bands a lot more kind of one on one. And this band, you know, when we're looking at something that we love, we just think of it as great music. And so our guest today is one of these uh, wonderful singers, an amazing voice, an amazing band, amazing songwriter. And I'm psyched to bring her in today, Courtney Marie Andrews. Call me when you get towards Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So where does your story start? I, you grew up in Phoenix, right? Is that is that correct? Yes. Grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. And is that a musical town? Like what what is how did you kind of like drift into music in in those days like what was the story well i think back then it was kind of definitely more of like this a punk kind of punk and metal scene and that sort of thing but uh around my 15 or 16 year i there was a randomly like a large kind of songwriter folk scene and 
in Phoenix. And really? I used to throw these, yeah, I used to throw these kind of like DIY shows at art spaces. And, you know, we all do songs and sit cross-legged and do the whole thing. <laughs> um, was there like any kind of mentors or folks in that scene that you are still around? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, there was a bunch. I mean, of people a little older than me doing it, 10, 15 years older than me. And yeah, my friends, Amy and Derek, who are this duo called Norman and a Whiskey Girl. They, they're they this kind of classic Arizona folk duo that mm-hmm. uh, I I loved. And yeah, so, it, you know, it was a, it was a little bit of a scene, but there was definitely, you know, there's no music industry or anything. I just, I just knew, you know, I wanted to play in these kind of DIY art spaces. And <laughs> yeah. And did you like start with guitar or just do you, were you, what was the first instrument you were playing? Uh, I was playing guitar. Guitar? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I wrote songs on piano too. I had this little Casio I used to write songs on. <laughs> That's awesome. I you know, I actually don't know like the the regional styles of Phoenix. Like it's it's interesting to think about like what music is from there, you know. It's probably like uh, a crossroads of lots of music, right? Like people, Yeah. Is there like a, a scene there? Is there actually there's probably like a, a some kind of like Well, Stevie Nicks, Linda Ronstadt. There you go. From Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I stand correct. Uh, Alice Cooper. <laughs> wow. I need to brush up on my Phoenix. History. Yeah. But I feel like, yeah, typically it's like, it does feel like a place that kind of raises people who are generally going to cross over, you know? Yeah. Like it's, you You got the West Coast and you got the the country mix of, of Phoenix. So. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, and did you immediately, were you like always writing? Cause I, one of the things I just have always thought of you is a, like a songwriter, you are like a true songwriter. And was that something you just started like, or was it playing and listening and then started to do songwriting or were you always kind of like into that? I, this, the moment I picked up a guitar, I knew I wanted to write songs. I had no interest in learning other people's songs. Oh really? To, to my own detriment, really. I mean, I think I tried to learn like a violent femme song and that was about it. You know, I, I, from the moment, no cover bands. No, (laughs) I, I've never been interested in like, I mean, as I've gotten more into it, I, I like to study the music of others and play songs that mean a lot to me, of course, but, but really like the moment I could, could create something that was really the, what I was in it for, you know, that's, that's so cool. I mean, you did have a brief, you were, uh, in a pretty famous band. <laughs> so you did, uh, right? I think, was that, so like you were in, somehow you you ended up in Jimmy Eat World, right? Which is a huge band. Yeah. When I was a kid, I, well, I, you know, around Phoenix, they're another band from Phoenix. And I, I, by the time I was, you know, 19 years old, which is when I started touring with them, I had gone on tour multiple times, booked tours up and down the West Coast, um, released you know, three or four albums and was, uh, kind of doing the DIY thing. And I think Jim, the lead singer recognized that, uh, it was something I really wanted to do and like my voice and yeah, I kind of didn't mean to, but I actually became like a backup singer when I was like a child. So <laughs> and yeah. when I'm like a world tour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I called out my college cause I really didn't know how any of it worked. He's like, Oh, you need a manager. I'm like, what is a manager? You know, what is a, <laughs> what is a publisher? What do these people do? You know, I didn't, I didn't know. So yeah, you got to have people to like, and that's such a strange, like first kind of major, you know, to be thrown in a band and like, go on a giant world tour with so much structure around you. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like a yeah. band on Interscope and like, so they have so much formality and, you know, management going on and. Yeah. Uh, was that fun? Was that actually, was there? Oh yeah. I mean, I learned so much. I, I didn't know anything really until, until I went on that tour. So, but I was also a kid and I was green and naive and didn't know how to be a good band member. Probably, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I'd cry easily and you know, it, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> did they pay was, you there? They just, Hey, food and you know, you'll have a good time. <laughs> I actually, I bought my first passenger van because of that tour I and moved up to Seattle because of that tour. So that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. And that was, was that in 2011 you moved up to Seattle? Mm-hmm. Yep. What, what, where did you live outside of Seattle? Like what was, where was that? Well, 
I lived all over. I lived in, um, I, when I first moved there, I lived in Redmond. Mm -hmm. I dated this, this guy and we lived in his family's farmhouse for like a year. (laughs) And, um, then we, then we moved to Seattle. We lived like in Lake city for a bit. Improper. Yeah. And then for years, the end of the time living there lived out in Duval on the woods. Oh man. Um, I heard that is the tiniest little place. It is very small. Yeah. It took, it took me 20 minutes to get to the grocery store or the gas station through the woods. So. And the bar. Like, there's got to be a bar there too, right? Oh, that's where I, I bartended at the Duval Tavern. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. Out of all those places, was there, like, were you connecting to the music scene there too? Was there, like, influences coming in? Well, during that time when I first moved there, you know, it was, like, the height of, like, Fleet Foxes and mm-hmm. Head in the Heart and... Um, oh, yeah. Bazan and Gerardo and I mean the the songwriter scene was just like blowing up there when I you know moved there so so great yeah Damien is a is a incredible songwriter truly one of the best yeah I'm so grateful to have I played in his band and opened for him for many years and incredible yeah yeah he's amazing and when you were putting out records this whole time actually I think around um 2011 you you crossed paths we just kind of figured this out we always say compare notes when we do a podcast and and randomly our producer tanner mccullough and um and one of the people who works in our admin terry uh they had a friend that grew up in estacada oregon his but he actually went to arizona his name was jim kuda do you remember jim that sounds so familiar. You, Jim. He was somehow down in Arizona, and you stayed on their couch in Portland one time when you came through in 2011. Oh, my gosh. Do you remember I, this? <laughs> did we play at their house? Or did we yeah, just... it, it was like 10 people staying at this house. It was like a, you know, like a college boy flop house that. Uh... Oh, my God. <laughs> I stayed on, you know, I have a lot of people to pay it forward to because I've stayed on so many couches in my life. I can't I can't even remember. But that sounds so familiar. And I'm sure if I saw him, I'd know right away. <laughs> yeah. That's funny how like paths cross because we were just talking and all of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah, um, I, Courtney stayed on our couch. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, and so you were in Duval. Like, so another person that actually connected with you through us that is our PR person, um, Devin Leger. Do you know Devin? Hearth, yeah. Hearth Media. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, he worked my record on his life. Which is an incredible record. That was the record that really made us just go, Oh hell yeah! We have to have Courtney. This is an, this is incredible. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was the record that that's the reason I'm not a bartender anymore. <laughs> oh really? Good job, yeah. Devin. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. So, we, did you write that in while you were living in Duval? Is that what was the story behind that record? So it's kind of a little bit disjointed, but I was bartending, and then I got this job to be a a backup singer for a Belgian songwriter named Milo. And um, I lived in Europe for like five months one summer. And I incredible. he was playing like amphitheaters and that sort of thing. And I, you know, somehow he had heard he was looking for a backup singer. And I somehow (laughs) came up and became his backup singer for the summer and lived in Europe. And while I was living in Europe was going through a breakup, but also kept my job at the bar you know i just told them i'm gonna go on tour and they love me and we i love them so they let me come back so i you know i was bartending and then i went on tour for five months lived in belgium and then i came back so i i wrote it a little bit in europe a little bit in in uh duval at the bar and that sort of thing so that's pretty cool like i mean it's probably pretty hard to find folks that are gonna that can work in duval because you're out in the middle of nowhere right you're gonna have to live there in the woods somewhere <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's a commitment definitely that's awesome and that record god it got a lot of it got a lot of press i mean it was the bluegrass situation album of the year it was brought up by rolling stone as one of the top country records of that year um and did you notice did things change like after that record did you get like management? Like what, what changed after that record for you that allowed you to stop being a bartender? Um, yeah, I got, it kind of all happened at once. You know, I, I feel like I was, even though I wasn't, you know, I, I felt like for years twiddling my thumb, waiting for things to happen, <laughs> mm-hmm. not really twiddling my thumbs, like actually putting in the work to try and find 
or get the, you know, get the ball rolling in whatever way. And, and then in classic form, you know, everything just toppled in. I released the record and within like a month, I had a manager and a booking agent and everything. And it's just happened all at once. <laughs> yeah. You had, a, you had the textbook with the college t- taught you, this is what you need. Now you got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it was so in 2017, you played Pickett on the first time. It was like uh, one of our friends, um, Daryl Houtman, you, was just a super fan. You wouldn't know him, but the band he was looking forward to the most was you and another. There was the two Courtney's used to talk about Courtney Granger from uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, who who passed away. He was an incredible singer. And you both of you guys were he he kind of anointed like the best singers he's ever heard. Like it was like, Aww. and yeah. Do you remember anything interesting happened that year when you were there? Like, do you, what is your memories of 2017 Pickathon? Oh, man. Well, pick a, I have to say this. I'm not just blowing smoke because you started it, but um, <laughs> I, I, Pickathon's one of my favorite festivals. I tell everybody that. Um, Thank you. It's very, yeah, it's very thoughtful and it's about the music and it's creative and um, it's environmentally friendly and it's just all the good things that uh <laughs> that you want in a festival and you know i i think the just experiencing the tree stage for the first time is like always um, <laughs> it's it's pretty awesome magical right yeah 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 we really we always we always joke nature is the best vibe so like, <laughs> you can build some really cool man made stuff but it's it's really so true. it's never going to compete with a stage built out of sticks in the woods. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it's yeah. just way cool. Um, that's awesome. And you actually, that wasn't the first year you played 2019 too. And, and the, there was a lot of kinds of change that I noticed kind of in your approach, like kind of leading up to this record. But, you know, um, I, I was doing a little bit of research and in 2000, 20 you were on tour right with um tallest man on earth at the beginning of covid was that correct yeah <laughs> yeah which would have been glorious awesome tour <laughs> i know i know we we had a really great two shows <laughs> they were they the were best really two great. shows ever yeah exactly yeah what was it like all of a sudden like you kind of felt like it was coming and then it was just like what was that experience for you? Like, okay, we're on tour. We're, we're, did the first two show already feel weird or was it like? What? Well, I was actually on tour for a week prior to the tallest man with Nathaniel Rateliff, who's also oh, played, wow. who's also yes. played, um, Pickathon cause I saw him there. <laughs> um, so there was definitely some ominous things leading up, you know, that I didn't, we didn't think the tour was just going to be canceled, but we were like, something's going on, you know, it doesn't feel quite right. People seem nervous and, you know, it was, uh, it was weird, you know, <laughs> it's kind of yeah. wild. It, it really feels, I can't believe that was, you know, almost four years ago, three or four years ago. Yeah. Three years ago. Yeah. It's wild. Um, it feels like a, another lifetime. Yeah. It was, it was super strange for us too. Just, just like kind of not sure if it was, you know, the, from, from like zero to 60, it turned into a serious issue. <laughs> yeah. And we had sold most of our tickets and the festival was planned and all, all of a sudden, you know, the festivals and music world, like us, we are not very like, nobody's rich. We're just barely making it by and having spent money on people and staff, it's like almost impossible to like, to like refund. It was like, Oh my God, life is going, I mean, we're, we're done. It, it, it's a weird, our story of survival, I'm sure is unique and to everyone else's, but like, how did you, what did you do? So COVID comes and shuts you down and what happens? What do you, where do you go? What do you do? Well, the first three months I was stumped and depressed. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, I also felt like I had to go through some sort of like purging process of, how to learn how to not do things, you know, mm-hmm. or like not go places. Cause I'd spent the past decade of my life, never not going somewhere for, you know, I'd gone somewhere at least every month for the past 10 years. So, wow. Um, after I got over my depression though, I, I started painting. Actually, I wouldn't say I got over it. I started painting and that kind of brought me out of my depression. Yeah. And, um, and I finished a book. I finished, I've been wanting to finish a collection of poetry forever. And I've always wanted to pursue literary, uh, the literary side of things as well. And, um, I, once I realized like, oh, 
I don't think it's going to be like this forever. And this is a very unique and special time to use, you know, I kind of went full force into just making things and that opened my world up. And now I'm like, it really hasn't stopped since then. I've just been, there has to be an element of creativity in my life all the time or else I go a little cuckoo. So it's kind of been like in a weird way, a blessing to come back to like what I felt like as a teenager, the excitement yeah. to just make something. Um, totally. It, it started that and it hasn't stopped. I've just been like, you know, really enjoying that aspect that it's given me. So what, what's the name of the poetry book that you wrote? It's called old monarch. Mm -hmm. Um, the butterfly, not, not the monarchy. <laughs> and it's just like a collection of poetry about all kinds of things. Or is there like a kind of a theme that ties it together? Um, I think growth is a theme. It's kind of mm -hmm. in three sections of past, present and future. Mm. And, um, and kind of, you know, metaphorically relates those things to the progression of a butterfly in, in some, some ways, you know, not, mm -hmm. not, uh, not scientifically, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, more, I guess, just visually that sort of thing. So, yeah, I always think of when you bring in kind of other forms of art, like, you know, we're, we've always thought of like, this isn't just a music festival. This is like a art festival. It's, it's food. It's, it's wellness. And I think when you cross pollinate across those different, you know, universes, it makes what you're trying to do even richer. Have you, yeah. have you found that like painting and kind of poetry is like really enriched your music? Oh yeah. It's interesting because when I first started, I felt overwhelmed. Like it was almost like every art form was like the siblings inside of me, like fighting mm -hmm. for my love, <laughs> you yeah. know, fighting for, for mother's love. And then I was like, wait, I love all these things equally and they do all feed each other. And I can't write songs every single day. And sometimes no. I do, sometimes I do for a month, but then you, your well runs out and then you need a paint and then that, then you paint for a month and then that well runs out and you need to write some poetry. You know, it's, it's, a uh, it's kind of a, more of like juggling now. And I, I really appreciate, you know, what it's done for my creativity. So that that's, that's really awesome. So like, how would you say it's uh, changing your music, like in a way, like, what would you think? Mm. Um, I am not afraid to look outside the box more, not afraid to explore. I mean, I've really been into like exploring sounds and sound palettes and that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. that's, that's very big, you know? the way that's affected my music kind of like paint palettes or like writing. Yeah. Yeah. Was there, yeah. was it, were you less open to that before is, was like a, you had a certain sounds and palette that you had to stick to? No, actually, you know, in, in my early twenties, I really went there. And then I, I, I really wanted, you know, I got really into like trying to make like the classic sounding record for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, and then I, you know, I feel like kind of going back to that, that sort of early uh, adulthood feeling of wanting to break the mold a little bit and see what happens. So yeah, like experimentation, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's important because you can always come back and make your, your harvest, you know, <laughs> Yeah. you can always make that record. And, um, I realized that. And, uh, so I think it's, it's exciting to, my whole motto as an artist with records is is to never make the same record twice. And um, I think that's continuing for me in some way. So, I mean, a lot of that, you know, comes from for me, like I, I always think of, OK, this is a lot. This is the best thing we've ever did. We can't you know, we always get stuck in this kind of mindset like you, you put so much energy in some, into creating something curating, you know, whatever. And for us, like on the Picathon, we'll, we'll hit 2000, you know, every year we're like, okay, that was a high water mark, and there's like no way we can do it better, but that's not the way they look at it. Right. It's like, yeah, no, I'm just gonna make it. I'm just going to take that same energy I did in the first place. I'm going to trust it. It's going to take me somewhere and it's going to be different. It's going to be, you know, it, it's kind of like not being afraid, right. To kind of recreate yeah. Cause it's, it's kind of scary. Like we put all this time and you're like, I, I think that's the best I can, you know, people may put that on us maybe even more than ourselves, but, um, yeah, it's kind of like not being afraid to like start at zero again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also not being afraid of perception, you know, 
the world is becoming more and more homogenized day by day. So I think it's ever more important for creatives to always try and look outside the box. Yeah. And do you have like, does your, I'm sure you're in your kind of arc of wherever you're at part is that a big part of where you're at in terms of like your music in terms of your process or are you thinking more of a style like what it like what drives that next record what is Uh, I don't I'm you know it's I don't know it's just you write this batch of songs and it's a feeling you know Mm -hmm. um everything I do is just a a feeling it's not really you know I, I have ideas and that sort of thing but it's like, it's all intuition <laughs> yeah. and uh, whatever's inspiring me at the time, like a mix of those, those things. And, you know, it's, I, that's, that's what, that's why records are so great. They're kind of great time markers, you know, mm-hmm. um, f- for our lives and for the, the listeners lives. So, yeah, I think the, the last record, um, loose, uh, future, you worked with uh, somebody that we admire humongously, right? Uh, Sam Evian. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Sam's and, great. And uh, we've tried to get his wife, Hannah Cohen, who we think is also an incredible singer. She's so good. She's so, amazing. Oh, such a good songwriter, such a good singer. And just, I don't know if they don't tour, but yeah, Sam has been to Pickathon. I think he was there the same year you were, right? Wasn't that correct? Yeah. In 2019? Yeah, actually. Actually, I first met Sam at Pickathon. No way. Okay. So yeah, tell us that the story. First, the first time I met Sam was at Pickathon. I'd come off stage and he's like, I really liked your set. That was amazing. And we just like talked and it was great. And then actually, just bring it completely full circle. I met him as like the pro, you know, I met him obviously very briefly at Pickathon. But then when Tallest Man on Earth, when our tour ended we tried to re- to make a record together that will never see the light of day but it's oh. like a, i know well we were all so in such a despair of like the world what f- seemed like it was seemingly ending that we weren't in the right headspace to make a record but we were like looking for a producer in upstate at after our tour ended because we thought it was only going to be two weeks mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and uh we found one it was sam and wow. we, we drove from Chicago all the way to upstate as our tour ended, recorded some songs, mostly covers. And um, and then that's how I really like decided I want to work with Sam. I loved working with him. And so, yeah. What's his style like as a producer? Um, It's very communicative. You know, it was really a lot of just mostly Sam and I like playing back and forth. Very nonchalant. The studio days are not more than four hours, five hours. Mm. Um. Very civilized. Very civilized. Very like, let's, but it's very condensed. Those four or five hours are very meaningful. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and uh, it was really cool to make a record like that. You know, I pretty much lived with him and they called me their roommate. You know, I lived with Hannah and Sam for like that summer. I lived there basically. And uh, we did pre-pro and took our time and it was really a special time. That's so cool. It's actually, he has... That once I've kind of figured that out, I can kind of hear Sam a little bit on your record. Like there's a Sam has some interesting like fingerprints that just like you when you know it, um, you know, like I, I was always listening to that Hannah Cohen record and I'm like, God, who in the heck does this remind me of? There, This thing is humongously big. Her voice is big. The songs get big. And yeah. And and I'm like. Of, and but say, that's like Sam, you know, like Sam reminds me of it. I mean, there's an there's another artist, Andy Schaff, who we really, really love. Um, oh yeah, he's great. And Sam somehow, but Sam's just this, this crafter of like sound and and putting together kind of epic. Just it's things sound epic when he's when, he, when he, they're they're kind of simple, but they're epic at the same time. And you really, this record has that kind of epic feel. And I um, you know, it's incredible. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He's um he's really one of the best engineers too and and players as well. But he is one of the first records where he he mixed it and he sent it to me and I was like, Well, Sam, I, I don't think I have any notes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like That's I think I have awesome. a couple I have a couple here and there, but I'm like trying to make them up, you know, because this mm-hmm. is so good. Oh <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so great. I I I think of those kind of great producers, um, you know, and how much they add. I actually got the pleasure at one time to go down 
to uh, Cottage Grove and see Richard Swift. I don't know if you. Oh yeah, I've met Richard. I've know, I've met Richard a bunch because of Damien. Yeah, he used to record Damien's, and he was at the at that time he was doing um, a Lonnie Holly. <laughs> he was doing a Lonnie Holly record. Oh. It was like one of the first times Lonnie Holly was like recording, and the process was just crazy. They were just, you know, because he doesn't do the same song twice. He he doesn't ever. He just kind of riffs on an idea, and then it's gone. He might. He might recap it, but he really doesn't ever play anything twice. <laughs> yeah, he's improv only. He's improv only. And uh, yeah, I think of, you know, Sam in that same category, just like, just amazing. And, you know, this it's cool to see, it's cool to see the, the kind of intersection between you guys in this record. And it's, are you, do you see yourself kind of doing another record in the near future with, with anyone or what's your plan? Um, I, I've actually made one, but I'm not sure if I'm going to release it. Come on. <laughs> we'll see. I Tease mean, us. Um, just give, give yeah. hints. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's completely different than the last one. Classic. And, um, that's right. Start. Yeah. And, uh, so we'll see, but it's, it's, uh, you know, pretty dark and slow and <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, does the world need this right now? Maybe it does, but yeah. I, I think if it inspires you, like that's, you know, when you know it feels right, it's other, and that's, yeah, other yeah. people are going to feel right. It's kind of like, I've come to that point where you're just like trusting your, just the very basic instinct and, you know, it may not make economical sense. I won't say those things always line up. Right. But it's, in terms of like people who appreciate it and you're in your world, they're going to love it. I'm pretty sure. And so I will be, I'm very excited for that. (laughs) (laughs) Are you going to play any of that music this year at the festival? Yeah. We've been playing a couple of those songs in the set. Um, you're sure I like to throw, I like to throw new ones out of the band and see if they can play along. (laughs) You've got a great band. Actually. I think you're the only, you're the only band that's, kind of playing in two different bands like you have the only band that's sharing members because yeah because the they're so good the colonel yeah, i don't mm-hmm. know if you know the colonel oh uh, yeah he's amazing he's amazing right he's he's another one of these songwriters like just yeah like incredible so which members do you guys actually share um well i think this time it's actually just Jerry Bernhardt, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And what's he um, play? Maybe he plays the guitar and he he did a lot on the Colonel's last record and um was a big part of that record. So that's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, we had to schedule. So we usually have a something we call schedule Sudoku, where we across different ba- um, time slots and across a stage, we're not allowed to put the same styles of music. So you can't see two things in a row and we never cross connect, you know, you, if you're at a stage and you really want to go see a certain style, you might be able to chase it down at another stage. And it's, it's really fun for us, but it's also kind of part of our ethos. Like you're going to like listen to music you never thought you were into, and then you're going to love it and you're going to be confused. And so that added a whole nother layer of Sudoku. We can't, you guys are sharing members, so we had yeah. to <laughs> make sure you had time to go somewhere and uh, and not like make your band like do do the run sprint. around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Got stage. Oh, I think we we're successful. So it's gonna, oh, good, good mm-hmm. job, Pickathon. Well, it's going to be a great year. Yeah, and we're really honored to have you. And I just you know like it's great to hear your music just kind of getting better and better every time. And I know whatever you kind of reinvent or kind of use it yeah your creative process is gonna be good again so i trust it i'm i'm yeah. excited thank you yeah and yeah we're, we're excited to come back yeah and well with that i want to say thank you for being our guest today it really has been an awesome honor to talk to you yeah it's been an honor thank you zale yeah and we'll uh we're gonna say shout out to everyone out there thank you this has been the end of episode nine uh pickathon podcast from the hope you we discovered something there for you you should learn to paint and you should learn to you should learn to uh, write and you're going to become a better musician <laughs> that's the new thing right you, gotta, yeah. you can even start a youtube channel on this like how it all comes together <laughs> exactly 
<laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you next week for episode 10. Thanks, Zale. Bye. Bye. This podcast is produced by Zale Schoenborn, Tanner McCullough, and Evan Throckmorton. Our artwork is by Travis Bone and additional support by Ryan Stiles. The music in this episode was by our guest of honor, Courtney Marie Andrews. The songs included were Monkey on a Chain, The Long Road Back to You, and the one we're riding into the sunset with, Older Now. A big thanks to the whole Pickathon family. Like Zale said, we'll catch you all next week. Dramatic path.